Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. Um, Could you speak great. to the mic? Sorry, I'm not even, I totally <laughs> Let's try this again. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the Southern Festival of Books. And I'm very excited to be hosting this session, Race and Place, Exploring the Impact of Inequality. We have three great authors on our panel, which I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, so before we begin the session, there's some housekeeping duties. So the session is scheduled to end at 5, so we'll wrap up the session a few minutes before then. After the session is over, all the books, um, will, all the authors will be upstairs in the signing colonnade to sign the books. And the books will be for sale at the Parnassus Book Sales Area, where a portion of every book sold directly benefits this great festival. So we encourage you to do that, as well as coming to get the book signed by the authors. Uh, as far as the format, I'll introduce each author, kind of start the session with some questions. Um, about their current book, how they became interested in this topic. But we want the session to be as interactive as possible, and we encourage you to get up and ask questions. There are mics on both sides of the room, so at any time, if you have a question, please feel free to get up um, and go to one of the, the microphones and, and ask the question. So first, um, I'll just briefly introduce the authors, and then we'll kind of get to the questions. So I see, you've ever got there. Um, so here on my left is Alice Goffman, who's an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her new book, On the Run, Fugitive Life in an American City, investigates the legacy of the war on drugs has had on one Philadelphia community she calls Sixth Street. After 40 years, the war on drugs has done little to prevent drugs from being sold or used, but it has created a little known surveillance state in America's most disadvantaged neighborhoods. Alice spent three, six years living in the Sixth Street neighborhood and focuses on an unforgettable cast of young African-American men who are caught up in this web of warrants and surveillance. Next, we have Chris, <coughs> oh, Chris, Chris Tomlinson, who is the author of Tomlinson Hill. As the great-great-grandson of Texas slaveholders, award-winning journalist Chris Tomlinson wanted to find out what crimes his ancestors had committed to maintain their power and privilege. In his new book, Tomlinson Hill, he writes about the slave-owning part of his family history. He also writes about the slaves who kept the Tomlinson name after they were freed and traces their family tree. Chris Tomlinson is a columnist for the Houston Chronicle and a fifth-generation Texan. He spent 14 years as a foreign correspondent with the Associated Press covering Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. He's reported from nine conflicts ranging from the end of apartheid in South, Carol in South Africa, post-genocide Rwanda, clan fighting in Somalia, and the U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And then we have um, Dr. Ellen Griffith Spears teaches environmental history in the interdisciplinary new college program in the Department of American Studies at the University of Alabama. Earning a PhD in American Studies from Emory University, her research focuses on environmental and civil rights history of the U.S. South in a global context with an emphasis on social studies of science, technology, and environmental public health. She has spoken on these themes around the U.S. and internationally and has authored numerous articles and essays, including Contributions in the American South in a Global World, Emerging Illness and Society, Negotiating the Public Health Agenda, and Where We Stand, Voices of Southern Descent. Her book, Baptized in PCBs, Race, Pollution, and Justice in an All-American Town, has been chosen to receive the 2014 Arthur J. Vizzletier, Vizzletier <laughs> Prize in Public Health History from the medical care section of the American Public Health Association. So thank you all three authors for attending the session today. Um, I just wanna start first um, to give each one of you kind of an overview of your book and then how you became interested in that subject and, and kind of your research process. So we'll start with Alice here in the corner. Oh. Thank you so much for moderating, Sandy. Um, hi everybody, how are you doing? Um, so uh, um, 
uh, up until the 1970s, the U.S. had this very stable incarceration rate, very, very flat. Then in 1970, it started climbing up, 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 until leveling off in the 2000s at uh, an extremely high rate. We now imprison five times more people per capita than we did 40 years ago, um, uh, seven to nine times more than any Western European nation, um, more than China. Um, only the forced uh, labor camps under Stalin in the former USSR have ever approached these levels of penal confinement. Um, so uh, the book that I wrote is, a, is an, I guess it's an on the ground look at um, America's prison boom. And um, I think uh, uh, for many people in this country, um, uh, uh, it affects many citizens not at all. Uh, many citizens don't even realize that this is happening. Um, because this is a, a pretty targeted effort uh, aimed at African-American neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, um, white neighborhoods, and also Latino neighborhoods, but particularly African-American neighborhoods. So when I was a freshman in college, I uh, got a job working at the cafeteria on campus where I was in college at the University of Pennsylvania. And then I started tutoring uh, the two grandchildren of my boss at the cafeteria, who was an African-American woman in her 60s who lived in a mixed income uh, African-American neighborhood near the university. And, um, and then Aisha, one of the young women I was tutoring, introduced me to um, her cousin, Ronnie, who had just come home from a juvenile detention center. And from, uh, from Ronnie, uh, Ronnie introduced me to Mike, uh, who was his older cousin. And, uh, and Mike and I became friends. And about like a few weeks after Mike and I met, um, uh, his uncle's house, which was his last known address, was raided by the police, and um, and uh, uh, they said he was wanted on a shooting charge. Mike uh, had not been any shooting to his knowledge, um, uh, but he now had a warrant out for his arrest for a shooting charge, a very serious charge. Uh, so he lived on the run uh, for a number of weeks until he scraped the money together to make uh, to pay a lawyer. Then he turned himself in, um, and then uh, and then he was in county jail. And, uh, and then uh, after um, a couple weeks of, so I started going to visit him in county jail. Um, that was the first time I'd ever been to a jail. And um, then he, he, um, uh, he was thrown in the hole, which is solitary confinement. And, uh, and then his relatives uh, put the money together to make his bail. And, um, and then he came home with this case hanging over his head. He had to go to court every month. So, uh, I started going to the court dates with him, and uh, the first court date he had, it was in this um, like local courthouse um, in the neighborhood, and, um, and uh, as we walked in, he, he shared a cigarette with a guy standing outside who he happened to know, and I thought, oh, that's funny, he just happens to know a guy standing outside. Um, and then when we walked in uh, on the defendant side of the room, he greeted like half of the young men in there. Um, he knew them from the neighborhood. Um, and I started to realize this isn't just happening to Mike. Um, and the other young men in the courtroom that day weren't just there for, um, for violent charges. They were there for unpaid court fees. They were there for probation and parole violations, like uh, failure to um, um, uh, like, um, pass an alcohol test or, um, or make curfew. Um, uh, they weren't in school. They were sitting in court. Um, so at the time, I didn't, I didn't know about the prison boom. I didn't know that we were incarcerating 60% um, of African and young men who have not graduated from high school. I had no idea. I was a, a sophomore in college um, and a white woman um, coming from a very middle class background. Um, but at that point, I asked Mike if I could write about his life um, for what was then my senior thesis at, at Penn. Um, and he said, yeah, great. So then I spent the next uh, six years living in that neighborhood um, and getting to know his friends and relatives.